Okay, uh, so this morning we want to t continue our discussion of conservation of linear momentum with by looking at a few different examples which are going to drive the point home which we have been talking about. Okay, just a minute. Okay, yeah. So we're going to look at a couple of examples, uh, probably three examples, which are going to drive the point home about what we've been talking about, especially in terms of uh, talking about conservation of linear momentum. And we're going to look at another example, which, is, which talks about conservation of kinetic energy. So the next few examples we're going to look at basically have to do with conservation of linear momentum. And this is one of them. Uh, let me see if we have to admit some people. Okay. So, uh, example number four. A 40,000 freight car, which is a train, a freight is a train, a train car, is coasting at a speed of five meters per second along a straight track when it strikes a 30,000 kg stationary freight car and couples to it, so they join. What will be their combined speed after impact? So, what we are actually discussing here with this question is a collision where a train car which is moving at five meters per second and since we are talking about trains so these things have to be heavy combines with another train collides couples collide with another train car which is stationary and they combine and since there is a collision there has to be movement after that so for us to do this, for us to find out what is going to be their speed after impact, we need to know how much motion was there before impact. We need to know what is the amount of motion which is there before impact. And this amount of motion in physics, when you're talking about motion and how much motion is there, how much motion is happening, motion is given in terms of linear momentum. So, before impact, there is the 40,000 40, freight car, which is moving at 5 meters per second. Then you've got this other one, the uh, 30,000 kg freight car, which is stationary. So, one of them is moving, the other one is stationary. So, clearly, you can see that the motion which you have here is as a result of only the freight car, which is stationary. Now, with conservation of linear momentum, because these things are going to collide, conservation of linear momentum only happens when you work out what is the total amount of motion. The total amount of motion before impact is given by the total linear momentum. So we are going to let, we're going to let, or we're going to denote this 40,000 uh, 40, kg freight car to be our first mass, M1. So we let, so we denote. Uh, the 40,000 kg freight car to be our M1, then we also denote the, the, the velocity of this freight car before it collides. We denote that as U1. U1 is the velocity of the first car before it collides, and that's going to be 5 meters per second. Then we also denote uh, the mass of the other car, which is stationary. We denote that as M2, and that is 30,000 kgs. And since it is stationary, uh, we know that something which is stationary has got a velocity of 0 meters per second. So the, its mass, the mass of the second car, U2, is going to be 0 meters per second, like we have here. With this information, it is possible for us to calculate how much total motion is there before these cars collide. It's possible for us to calculate what is the total amount of motion which is there before these freight cars collide. And that is what you're going to do by working out the, the total linear momentum. 
So the total linear momentum before impact, before the collision happens, basically this is going to be the sum of the uh, linear momentums of each of the objects which are involved, which are moving before the impact. So we're talking about the linear momentum of the first car, which is M1, U1, the mass of the first car multiplied by the velocity of the first car before impact U1 plus uh, M2, which is the mass of the second car multiplied by the velocity of the second car, which is U2. So this bit here, M1, U1 plus M2, U2, this is what gives us the total linear momentum before impact. This total linear momentum before impact basically measures how much motion is there before the impact. So that's going to be given by the mass of the first car, which is 40,000 kgs, multiplied by the velocity of the first car, which is 5 meters per second, plus uh, the mass of the second car, which is the 30,000 kgs, multiplied by the velocity of the second car. The second car is stationary, so its velocity is zero, like that. So when we work out what this is, we end up having 200,000 kgs meters per second. As you can see, this bt here, 30,000 times zero, this is zero. So this 200,000 kg, uh, kgs meters per second is only coming as a result of the motion which is happening with the first car. So the total amount of motion before impact is equals to 200,000 kgs meters per second. And this is as a result of the first car moving. Okay. Are we clear? You always have to find out what is the total amount of motion if there's going to be a collision. Okay. Are we clear? Yes, sir. Next, we are told after the collision, <clears throat> the freight cars couple to each other. They couple, which means that they combine. So the 40,000 kg freight car and the uh, 30,000 kg freight cars these cars combine if they combine then they are going to have a combined mass m1 plus m2 that's what what that, that's, that's the mass they're going to have if they combine then they will have a combined mass of m1 plus m2 and they are going to move with the same velocity after impact which is the v so this m1 and m2 this m1 and m2 refers to the combined mass of the freight cars after they couple to each other and they will move with a velocity v that's what that's the velocity we are looking for so uh what can we do so we know the mass of the first freight car we know the mass of the second freight car so the first freight car has a mass of forty thousand kgs the second one has got a mass of uh, thirty thousand kgs so we can add these masses so we end up with seventy thousand kgs and after we add these masses, we multiply with the velocity. So the combined mass of these cars is now 70,000. This 70,000 multiplied by the velocity after impact, which is V. Remember, we always denote the velocity before impact as U and the velocity after impact as V. And these velocities V and U, when you're talking about linear momentum, conservation of linear momentum, we assume that these objects which are going to collide we will have the same velocities. Their velocities before impact to be constant. Their velocities after impact to be constant. Because there is no force before impact. There is no force after impact which is going to cause the velocity to change. The force which is going to cause the velocity to change is only there during the impact. When there is an impact, that's when the force is there. That's why the velocity will change. But before impact... And after impact, before the, these cars collide, and after they collide, there is no force which acts on them. Therefore, their velocities can be assumed to remain the same. When, so this is, and this conservation of linear momentum, we only use it just before the impact happens and just after the impact happens. We don't use it 30 minutes before. We don't use it one hour after the impact. No, because one hour after the impact, other things can happen. There is usually force, like friction and stuff like that. So just before impact and just after impact, that's when this works. 
So the total linear momentum, which is the total amount of motion after impact, after this train couple, is going to be 70,000 kgs multiplied by the velocity. So what we have here, up here we have the total linear momentum before impact, which is 20,000 kgs meters per second. Uh, down here we have the total linear momentum after impact, which is 70,000 kgs times V. Since momentum is always conserved, conservation of linear momentum, the total linear momentum is always conserved. What this means is that the total linear momentum before the, these train cars collide and just after they collide should be the same. Since this is a case, there's always conservation of linear momentum, then we can equate the total linear momentum before impact and the total linear momentum after impact. The one before impact is this one. It's a 200 thousand kgs meters per second and after impact is a 70,000 kgs multiplied by V. So with this we can work out what the velocity of the freight cars is after impact. We can work out for V and to find V we're going to divide both sides by 70,000 which is what I'm doing here. V is equal to 200,000 kgs meters per second divided by 70,000 and we approximately end up with this which basically is approximately 2.9 meters per second. So, <clears throat> after impact, the freight cars move with a velocity of 2.9 meters per second. So, there is one thing you can see here. The first car had a velocity of 5 meters per second. Then after impact, the combined velocity is 2.9 meters per second. So, the velocity of the first car is reduced by the impact and that's basically what happens when something when you collide with something we expect your velocity to reduce okay then the velocity of the stationary car which is moving at uh, which was which was stationary the 300 kgs meters per second this freight car was stationary but after collision its velocity also becomes 2.9 meters per second so the freight car which was moving at 5 meters per second after it collides with a stationary car its velocity reduces to 2.9 the freight car which was stationary which had a velocity of 0 meters per second before impact after impact it moves with a velocity of 2.9 meters per second now this change in velocity is because there is a force this change in velocity is an acceleration. Are we clear? Yes. This change in velocity which these freight cars are experiencing is an acceleration. The other one slows down, the other one increases. And this only happens during the time when the impact, during the impact. That's when there is this change. So the, the force which is causing the, the change in velocities only exists during the time of the impact. After the impact, before the impact, this force is not there. There is no force before impact. There is no force after impact. That's what we assume when you're talking about conservation of linear momentum. So the force is only during the time there is an impact. Okay. Any questions with this example? Are we clear? Sure. Okay. Next, we move on to another example. Uh, example number five. Now, in example number five, uh, the other two examples you have looked at, things end up getting stuck or being coupled. But in example number five, that's not the case. Things don't get coupled or get stuck. Things actually move on their own. So, uh, example 5 reads, a 7 gram bullet moving horizontally at 200 meters per second strikes and passes through a 150, k 150 gram tin can seated on a post. Just before impact, the can has a horizontal speed of 1.8 meters per second. What is the bullet's speed after leaving the can? So again, when a bullet 
hits something that is a collision the bullet is collide as much as the bullet has been fired from the gun the bullet collides that's how bullets work if the bullet doesn't collide against something then we call it a miss so a bullet has to collide with something if you if a bullet collides with something then we say oh that's a hit someone has hit the target so in this case probably this guy whoever was doing this was practicing their shooting skills their aim and everything so they actually managed to hit the target which is a can which is seated on a post now the bullet has got a mass which is seven grams and it's moving with a velocity of 200 meters per second when it comes out of the gun so the bullet has got momentum the can itself has got a mass of 150 grams and it's seated on a post so its velocity is zero meters per second so the can does not have uh, any motion happening with it before it's hit by the bullet after it's hit by the bullet we are told that the can moves off speeds off with a speed of 1.8 meters per second so after being hit by the bullet the can now has some velocity 1.8 meters per second and we are being asked to find what is the velocity with which the bullet leaves the can so again for us to do this we need to look at this problem as a collision problem if we look at it as a as a collision problem then we can apply conservation of linear momentum so for us to do that if we are going to apply looking at it as a collision problem then we are applying conservation of linear momentum then we need to denote the mass of the bullet which is the seven grams so here the mass of the bullet we denote it as m1 so m1 is going to be seven grams which is going to be equal uh and we need this seven grams in kgs so it's going to be 0 0.007 kgs then the velocity of the bullet before it hits the can that's what we denote as u1 u1 is the velocity of the bullet before it hits a can we denote that as 200 meters per second squared uh, that's equal to 200 meters per second squared then the mass of the can the tin can that is m2 that is 150 grams and we change this into kgs that's going to be 0 0.15 kgs then the velocity of the tin can before it's hit by the bullet that's u2 and that's going to be zero meters per second like that so with this information we can work out what is the total linear momentum or how much motion is happening before the bullet hits the can the total amount of motion before the bullet hits the can has to be equal to the total amount of motion just after the bullet hits the can so the total amount of motion is given by a physical quantity called the amount of motion a particular object is undergoing is given by a physical quantity called linear momentum so linear momentum is a measure of motion so the total amount of motion before impact before the bullet hits the can that's going to be equal to the mass of the bullet which is u1 uh, uh m1 multiplied by the velocity of the bullet which is u1 plus the mass of the can which is u m2 multiplied by the velocity of the can which is u2 so this is going to give us 0 0.007 kgs multiplied by 200 meters per second plus 0 0.15 kgs multiplied by 0 meters per second so again here as you can see since one object is stationary the linear momentum or the other motion is coming from the bullet so this is going to be 0 0.017 times 200 plus this bit this bit here is what, uh, 0 0.15 times 0 so this bit gives you zero so all our linear momentum is coming from this bit here and that is that gives us 1.4 kgs meters per second so this is the total amount of motion which is there before impact so you have m1 plus m2 equals to sorry m1 plus u1 equals to m2 plus u2 which is equals 1.4 meters per second now after the bullet hits the can and passes through the can we are told that the bullet of course is going to have a velocity after it hits a can and this velocity we still do not know so the bullet has got an unknown velocity and the, this unknown velocity of the bullet we denote it as v1 after it passes through the can however the velocity of the can changes from being zero 
to 1.8 meters per second. So we denote this velocity of the can V2 as 1.8 meters per second. So we can work out the total amount of motion after impact based on the unknown velocity of the bullet V1 and the known velocity of the bullet V2, which is 1.8 meters per second. So we have M1, uh, M1, which is the mass of the bullet, multiplied by V1, which is the velocity of the bullet, plus M2, the mass of the can, multiplied by V2, which is the velocity of the can after impact. So this is going to be uh, the mass of the bullet is 0 0.07 kgs, multiplied by V1, which is the unknown velocity of the bullet, plus the mass of the can, which is 0 0.15 kgs, multiplied by the velocity of the can after impact, which are told is 1.8 meters per second, like this. So with this, when you do this calculation this side you end up with a 0 0.27 kg meters per, meters per second that is the linear momentum due to the can there is also this other part here the 0 0.07 kg v1 this is a linear momentum as a result of the bullet so the total linear momentum the total linear momentum after impact M1 V1 plus M2 V2 is equals to this uh, 0 0.007 kgs multiplied by V1 plus 0 0.27 kgs uh, meters per second. Now, since this is a collision problem, there is always a requirement that the linear moment, the total linear momentum, which is the total amount of motion, be conserved. So the total amount of motion before impact should be equal to the total amount of motion after impact. So basically that means that the total linear momentum before impact, which is M1, M1 U1 plus M2 U2 should be equals to uh, M1 V1 plus M2 V2. And this first bit here, the total linear momentum before impact, we know this is 1.4 kgs meters per second. That's what we have here. 1.4 kgs meters per second. And the other bit here, what we have this side is the total linear momentum after impact like this. So they have to be equal. The all the motion as long as there is no force because force is what causes motion. So if there is no force, external force acting on these objects before and after, then the motion has to be the same. All the total amount of motion before and after has to be the same. Okay, so we want to find what is the velocity of the bullet so in this case we get this part 0 0.27 we take it to the other side so we end up having 0 0.007 kgs v1 equals to 1.4 kgs meters per second minus 0 0.27 kgs meters per second and that's going to give us uh, 0 0.007 kgs v1 equals to 1.13 kgs meters per second we divide both sides by 0 0.007 when we divide both sides by this bit here we end up having V1 is equal to 1.13 kgs meters per second divided by 0 0.07 kgs and that's going to give us 1.16 meters per second. So we can see that the velocity of the bullet after it passes through the can becomes, becomes 161 meters per second. So the velocity of the bullet has reduced from 200 meters per second to... 161 meters per second and this is exactly what you expect now this is just as a result of a bullet passing through a tin can an empty tin can so the velocity of the bullet reduces the reason why the, the reduction in the velocity of the bullet is because as the bullet passes through the can it experiences a certain amount of friction and that amount of friction causes its velocity to reduce, since friction always slows down things. Are we clear? Yep. Now, with this, I think you can see that it's possible that if one can, if one can, uh, tin can can reduce the velocity of uh, a bullet from 200 to 161 meters per second. It's possible for you to stop a bullet 
with a cup of tins. If you can put one more tin, I think the, the percentage reduction uh, right now from 200, uh, so 161 minus 200 uh, divided by 200 times 100. There. So basically, one, one tin can has reduced uh, the velocity of the bullet by about 20%. So if the velocity of the bullet is, if one can can reduce the velocity of the bullet by, 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 by 20%, it means that if you can line up five cans, it is possible to literally bring this bullet to a stop with five cans. If you can put one can after the other, one can after the other, five of them, it's possible, theoretically possible that you can stop the bullet. What this actually shows is that when when when, when someone when, when guns are being shot hide behind anything whether it's a small tree or it's a desk or anything just hide behind anything as long as a bullet passes through something its velocity will reduce so at the end of the day if that bullet has to touch you most likely if you're hiding behind something it will probably hit you with a much much reduced velocity which will probably save your life are we clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, so basically the velocity of bullets, when bullets pass through things, their velocity reduces. As they collide with things, the velocity of the bullet reduces. Any questions on this one? Can we move forward? Okay, uh, the one which is of interest, which I want to spend more time on, is example number six. Because example number six, apart from what we have just been doing, uh, what we have been doing so far is that we have been enforcing conservation of linear momentum because things are colliding. So we expect we are expected to enforce conservation of linear momentum. Now, with example number six, there is something else also which is being conserved, which is what is referred to as the total kinetic energy. And the total kinetic energy is only conserved when you have what is referred to as an elastic collision or a perfectly elastic collision. So if you have an elastic collision or a perfectly elastic collision, then in such a case, you also have to make sure that the total amount of kinetic energy which is there and the total amount of before impact and after impact are the same. That's what you have to ensure. You have to ensure that the total amount of kinetic energy before and after impact are the same. So in our example here, just a minute. So in our example here, we have uh, example six, uh, two identical balls. So these are two balls identical, meaning that they've got the same mass, two identical balls. They've got the same mass. They are made of the same material. They've got the sh same shape. Basically these are balls which are made of the same, have got the same mass and they're made of the same material. So two identical balls collide head on. Two identical balls collide head on. If the initial velocity of one is 0 0.75 meters per second east, while that of the other is 0 0.43 meters per, meters per second west. So if the initial velocity of one is 0 0.75 meters per second east, while that of the other is 0 0.43 meters west. If the collision is perfectly elastic, what is the final velocity of each pole? So what we have here are two balls which have got the same mass. Because these balls have got the same mass, we don't really care what their masses are, as we are going to show. If you have got two objects which have got the same mass, then they collide. It's not really important to know what the mass is, because they're identical. Okay, that's the first thing which you're going to show, that it's not important. You can actually do a lot. You can have a lot done, 
without actually knowing what the masses of these objects are. Now, what we know is the velocity. And velocity is a vector. A vector has got magnitude and it has got direction. So the first ball, the first one, has got a velocity of 0 0.75 meters per second. This is the size of the velocity and east is the direction. The second pole has got this size of velocity, 0 0.43 meters per second, and the direction is west. So in this example here, as you can see, we have to consider direction. Direction is very important. So the direction has to be considered. So if direction is important, then you need to choose which direction is going to be positive and which direction is going to be negative. The directions we have here, east and west, they are just opposite of each other. East is one way, west is the opposite of the other. So you could decide to choose to say, you are going to choose a velocity which is going in the east to be a positive velocity. If you do that, then the velocity which is going in the velocity towards the west, which is the opposite of east, is going to be negative. Or you can choose to say west is going to be positive. If west becomes positive, then east is going to become negative. That's up to you. But you need to make a choice with direction. Once you make a choice with direction, then you have to stick to it. Are we clear? How you choose which one is going to be west, which one is going to be east, depends on you. The physics itself should remain the same. Is that clear? Yes, sir. Yeah, so you need to choose which direction is going to be positive, which direction is going to be... Once you choose a particular direction to be positive, it means that anything opposite that direction is going to be negative. In our example, as we are going to show, we choose east to be positive. If east becomes positive, then west automatically becomes negative. The other thing to be aware of is what we mean by identical in physics. Identical in physics simply refers to that these objects have good equal masses. So basically we are saying the mass of the first object, which are denoting as m1, is equal to the mass of the second object, which are denoting as m2, and these masses that are equal, we're just going to call them m. So the first ball which is M1, is moving east. The second ball, which is M2, is moving in the opposite direction, which is west. So we choose the eastern direction to be positive. If we choose the eastern direction to be positive, it means that the west is going to be negative. So if we have chosen east to be positive, it means that the velocity of the first ball, which is this one, 0 0.75 meters per second, the velocity of the first ball before it collides, that's what you're denoting as U1, the velocity of the first ball before collision, u1 is going to be positive so we're going to write its velocity as plus 0 0.75 meters per second since this is a choice we have made it means that the velocity of the second ball which before collision which is u2 this second ball is moving in the western direction since we have chosen east to be positive it means that the velocity of the second ball is going to be negative it's going to be minus 0 0.443 meters per second before impact so our choice of direction makes us have these two velocities, u1 equals to plus 0 0.75 meters per second and u2 equals to minus 0 0.43 meters per second. With this information, since the masses are identical, it's possible for us to find out what is the total amount of motion which is happening before impact, because these balls are going to collide. So the total amount of motion before impact is given by the total linear momentum before impact. That's going to be the mass of the first ball multiplied by the velocity of the first ball plus the mass of the second ball multiplied by the velocity of the second ball, like that. However, we know that these balls are identical. So therefore, this whole expression of the total linear momentum before impact we become we can be simplified and can be made simple instead of writing m1 we're just going to write m which is the mass of the balls m multiplied by u1 plus m multiplied by u2 and we factor out the m we end up with m equals to u1 which is the velocity of the first ball plus u2 which is the velocity of the second ball like this so this is the total linear momentum before impact here 
m equals to u1 plus u2 this one here next we know that uh, this kinetic thing we're going to skip it a bit we'll come back to it later we know that after this boss collide since they're going to collide head on, the balls can't pass through each other, so they have to bounce. So they bounce off each other and they move in the opposite directions. So the meaning that if they they collide head on, the ball which was moving in the east, the first ball will start moving in the west. The ball which was moving in the west after the collision will start moving in the east. So basically these things are going to collide. And they will have velocities after that. So the velocities of these objects after the collision they're going to be v1 and v2. So after collision, the velocity is going to be v1 and v2. So we can also get an expression for the total linear momentum after impact. That total linear momentum expression after impact is a carbon copy of this one. M, uh, open bracket, u1 plus u2, because we start with the same expression. So and to, un to end up with this. So it's going to be basically, you start with m1, plus v1 m1 multiplied by v1 plus m2 multiplied by v2 but m1 is equals to m2 so basically at the end of the day the total linear momentum is going to be the same as this m equals to v1 plus v2 are we clear here how we end up with the total linear momentum after impact which is equals to m uh, v1 plus v2 is it clear to everyone it's just a copy of this one this so instead of you having u1, you put v1. Here, instead of having v u2, you put v2. Then you do what you had done here. Then you end up with this. That's what gives us this. Is it clear? Uh, yes, it is clear. Okay. So we have, uh, we have total linear momentum before impact, which is m open bracket u1 plus u2 close bracket then we have a total linear momentum after impact which is m uh open bracket v1 plus v2 so we can equate these because this is the collision these two balls are colliding so when these balls collide then there has to be conservation of linear momentum the the amount of motion before and after they have to be the same so we can equate these and when you do that equation this is what you end up with you end up with m open bracket u1 plus u2 close bracket equals to m open bracket v1 plus v2 close bracket like that but the m which we have here on both sides of this equation is the same so we can cancel out the m when you cancel out the m what you remain with is this one you remain with u1 plus u2 is equals to v1 plus v2 now we know what u1 is it is plus 0.75 we know what u2 is it's minus 0 0.43 but we do not know what v1 and v2 are this v1 which is the velocity of the first ball after impact and the velocity of the second ball after impact we still do not know these however we can find out an expression of how these two are related v1 and v2 so we can say we can write this as v1 plus v2 is equal to u1 plus u2 and this is uh, in place of u1 and u2 we can make substitutions that's going to be plus 0 0.75 meters per second plus then minus 0 0.43 so we end up having v1 plus v2 equals to 0 0.32 meters per second so this is how v1 which is the velocity of the first ball and the velocity of the second ball after impact are related they are related in a certain way v1 plus v2 equals to 0 0.32 meters per second of course when you drop your science since you have to as you are going to see, we have to solve this. We will need another equation. So we have to create an equation from this expression. If you just drop the units, you end up having V1 plus V2 equals to 0 0.32. So this is what we have so far. There are two things we do not know. We do not know V1. We do not know V2. So there are two unknowns, V1 and V2. So how do we solve this problem? We have to go back a bit. And recall what kind of collision is happening. That the collision is perfectly elastic. Now, when you are dealing with a perfectly elastic collision, what it means is that the total kinetic energy before collision and after collision have to be the same. 
So we can work out what is the total kinetic energy before collision. And that's what is done here. Here. The total kinetic energy, we know that before they collide, these masses, identical masses, M1 and M2, have got velocities U1 and U2. So the total kinetic energy is going to be equal to half, half M1 U1 squared plus half M2 U2 squared. So this is what gives us the total kinetic energy. However, we know also that M1 and M2 are the same. So here, so the whole thing can be related like this. So half M1 U1 squared plus half M2 U2 squared can be written as half M. So we factor out the M since it's the same. So we end up with half M U1 squared plus U2 squared. So this is the total kinetic energy before these masses collide. So we are now interested in kinetic energy because we are told that the collision is elastic. After the collision, just after the collision, we know the masses of these velocities. The masses don't change, but we also know the velocities. The velocities are going to be V1 and V2. So similarly, in a similar fashion, we can work out what is going to be the total kinetic energy after impact with this expression here. Half uh, M1 V1 squared plus half M2 V2 squared. So this is the total kinetic energy after impact. And since M1 and M2 are the same, so this expression of kinetic energy, total kinetic energy, just becomes uh, half M open bracket V1 squared plus V2 squared. So this is what happens. So this is what it becomes. Okay, so we have our total kinetic energy before impact. So we have got our total kinetic energy after impact. So since the collision is perfectly elastic, there is a requirement that these total kinetic energies before and after impact should be the same. So we equate them. So this bit here is the total kinetic energy before impact. This other lot here is the total kinetic energy after impact. They have to be the same. Now, as you can see, there's a half m squared, there's a half times m, there's a half times m on both sides, so we can cancel that. Again, what you're seeing here is, it's not necessary for you to know the masses of this object since they're identical. So whenever you have identical masses, it's not necessary for you. Those identical masses should not prevent you from enforcing this conservation of linear momentum. So we are going to end up with u1 squared, plus u2 squared equals to v1 squared plus v2 squared. Again, in this case, we know what u1 is, we know what u2 is. Up to this point, are we clear with what you have done? Yes, sir. Okay. So, since we know u1 and u2, we can substitute for u1 and u2 to, so that we can find out how much, how v1 squared and v2 squared are related to each other. So V1 squared plus V2 squared is going to be equal to, again, we chose, remember, we chose east to be our positive direction and west to be our negative. So we, st we still stick to that. So we end up having U1 as plus 0 0.75 meters per second squared, the whole thing squared plus minus 0 0.43 meters per second, the whole thing squared like that. And when you do that, so this whole thing squared, it will be positive. This negative value squared, you come out positive. When you do that, you end up having V1 squared plus V2 squared is equal to 0 0.7474 meters per second squared. This is what you end up having. When you drop your units, since you're trying to come up with some, some equation which we can use, we end up with V1 squared plus V2 squared is equal to 0 0.7474, like this. So now we have got two expressions which try to tell us how V1 and V2 are related. The first one, if you remember, is this expression here, up here. V1 plus V2 is equal to 0 0.32. This other expression we've got from our conservation of kinetic energy, V1 squared plus V2 squared is equal to 0 0.7474. So these two ex equations we have come up with. The first one, from enforcing conservation of linear momentum, the second one from enforcing conservation of kinetic energy, we get these two expressions. With these expressions, it becomes possible for us to find out what V1 and V2 is. And how are we going to do that? 
we are going to use the first one, v1 plus v2 equals to 0 0.32. Using this expression, we're going to rewrite it as v2 is equal to 0 0.32 minus v1. So we're going to get this v1, take it to the other side. Or you can choose to get v2, take it to the other side. So what you want to do is up to you, what you prefer. In my case, I just get the v1, I take it to the other side. If you want to take v2 to the other side, that's up to you. So in our case, we end up having uh, v2 is equal to 0 0.32 minus v1. If you chose to take v2 to the other side, you en you'd end up with v1 is equal to 0 0.32 minus uh, v2 this side. That's what you'd end up with. But what I've done is I've moved v1 to the other side. So I end up with this expression. So what am I trying to do here? With this expression here, I'm trying to substitute this here. I'm trying to substitute it here. This is where I'm trying to substitute. So I want to sub this expression v2, which is called 0.32 minus v1. I want to substitute it there so that I end up with an equation which is only in terms of v1. And hopefully I'll be able to solve this equation. Okay, so when we do that, when we do that substitution, I end up with here, I end up with uh, v1 squared plus 0 0.32 minus v1 so in place of v2 i put this then i square it equals to 0 0.7474 then i expand i end up having v1 squared is equals to this this things expanded like that because of that then i start multiplying this times that uh this same thing times the v then this times this then v times v when i do that i end up with this i end up with v1 squared plus 0 0.32 squared minus 0 0.32 v1 minus 0 0.32 v1 plus v1 v1 squared this side then uh minus 0 point this bit i take to the other side above the equal sign the other side of the equal sign i end up with minus 0 0.74 like, like that then there is v1 here there is v1 here so i end up with uh 2 v1 which is what i have here then of course there is this minus 0 0.32 v1 minus 0 0.32 v1 so i end up with minus uh, 0 0.64 v1 then there is this thing here which i have 0 0.32 squared and there is this bit there so i end up with minus 0 0.645 here like this it goes to zero so if you so this is a very this is very good so we now have some equation now if you look at this equation carefully if you look at this equation carefully this equation looks similar to this ax squared plus bx plus c equals to zero this which i've highlighted here is a quadratic equation and why do i say it's a quadratic it's a quadratic in terms of v1 so you have got 2 v1 squared minus 0 0.64 v1 minus 0 point like that so in our case if it's a quadratic then the a is the 2 the x is the v1 then the b is the minus 0 point minus 0 0.64 then the c is the minus 0 0.645 so basically here our x is equals to v1 our a is 2 our b is minus 0 0.4 uh, 0 0.64 our c is minus 0 0.645 like this so basically, we have got all the terms which we need to treat this as a quadratic. And if it's a quadratic, one of the easiest ways to solve any quadratic equation is to use the quadratic formula, which is what you have here. X is equal to minus B plus or minus square root of B of B squared minus 4A, 4AAC squared divided by 2A. So when you do that, uh, and we substitute for B, so our B is this one. We make substitutions. Our A is the that our c is that so we substitute in here you end up having uh v1 which is equals to 0 0.64 plus or minus 2.3 uh, 36 divided by 4 now as is always the case with the quadratic equation you are going to end up with uh two solutions so in this case our solutions the first solution v1 is going to be 0 0.64 plus 2.35 uh, 36 divided by 4 the other one v1 is equal to 0 0.64 minus 2.36 divided by 4 we end up having v1 is equal to 0 0.75 and v1 is equal to or v1 is equal to minus 0 0.43 so the first solution is v1 is equal to 0 0.75 meters per second squared 
and the other one is v1 is equals to minus 0 0.43 now these solutions mathematically they are okay because that's what you expect when you're doing a quadratic like in this case you get two solutions mathematically they are fine but you have to remember that in physics we use mathematics like we have just done here to make our life very easy but physically one of these solutions is not correct and it's not possible if we look at this one the first solution v1 is equals to 0 0.75 meters per second this solution is telling us that when these identical balls collide the first ball moves through the second ball and continues to move east at 0 0.75 meters per second it is as if the second ball it's colliding with did not exist so the first ball passes through the second ball as the colliding is, collision is happening they pass through each other as if nothing existed. Now, we know that this is not possible. Is that clear? It is not possible that the first ball is going to collide with the second ball and going to continue moving east with the same velocity of 0 0.75 meters per second as if nothing has happened. Is that clear? Because I'm sure some of you have played pool and you know that's not what happens. Some of those pool balls have the same mass. They don't pass through each other. But what we observe is that they, you, these things tend to bounce. So the, this first solution, V1 is equal to 0 0.75 meters per second, is not physically possible. So we can't have this one as a solution. So we are left with the other one. V1 is equals to minus 0 0.43 meters per second. Now, this solution has got a minus. The minus is telling you that the first ball is going to move in the west. That the first ball is going to bounce, then move westwards. That's what the minus is telling you. And this is exactly what we expect. That if two things are going to collide, they will bounce off, they don't stick to each other, they bounce off each other. If they bounce, then the other thing moves in the opposite direction. So this bit makes a bit of sense. The minus is showing that the first ball is going to move westwards. However, there is something else which is happening. If you look at the velocity of the second of the first ball, this velocity is this velocity we have seen before. Excuse me, Bill. Now, this velocity we have seen before, the velocity of minus 0 0.43 meters per second was the velocity of the second ball which was moving west. So, when the bounce happens, the first ball moves westwards with the velocity of the second ball. Are we clear? This only happens because these balls have got identical masses. This phenomena only happens because the balls have identical masses. So the first ball, when it collides with the first ball, with second ball, it's going to bounce westwards and it's going to continue moving west with the velocity of the ball which was moving the second ball. Is that clear? So there's an exchange of velocities here. Are we clear? If the masses are not identical, then, yes, the first ball is going to move west, but it will not move west with the same velocity. I don't think it's going to move west with the same velocity. It's possible that it will move west with some other velocity, but it, this only happens if the balls have identical masses. This exchange of velocities only happens when the balls have got identical masses. Are we clear? 
Okay. So we take V1 to be minus 0 0.43 meters per second. If V1 is minus 0 0.43 meters per second, then we can find out what V2 is. So V2 from this expression, from the expression we formed earlier, V2 is equals to minus 0 0.32 minus v1 so we now know what v1 is v1 is this v1 is minus 0 0.43 meters per second so with that when you substitute here you end up having v2 is equal to 0 0.32 minus minus 0 0.43 and this is going to give us a v2 of which is equal to 0 0.75 so we end up having v2 as 0 0.75 meters per second and this shows exactly what you are saying to say now we are being told we are seeing that the second ball which was moving west is going to move is going to bounce move east but it's going to move east with a velocity of the first ball is that clear so there is an exchange of velocities Yes. Now, I want, I don't know, are you having another class now? No, I'm not. Okay, I want to show you a small video of this phenomenon. I want to show you a small video on YouTube of this phenomenon happening. Where identical balls are colliding. I want to show you a small video. Uh, just a minute. It will, the video is less than, is, is, uh, less than four minutes. So just bear with me, so that you can actually demo. We can show, you can see this thing uh, in motion. Are you seeing my? My my YouTube? Yes, sir. Uh, yes. Okay. So before uh, before this whole thing starts. These masses which are colliding in this setup, this is what is called a Newton's cradle. This whole thing, the masses that are colliding in this setup are identical. So you see these masses exchange velocities. And the reason why the exchange of velocity is there is because one, this is one of those, there's collision. So there's conservation of linear momentum. The other thing is there's also conservation of kinetic energy. So this is one of those setups where kinetic energy, now, you have to notice that how is the exchange happening one of the masses had a velocity which was zero so it the other one had a velocity which was not equal to zero so they are exchanging the other man takes this velocity the other one gets a velo zero velocity so it remains stationary the other one moves like that so basically that's how the exchange is happening I think you can continue with that. Basically, that's what I wanted to show. Okay. Any questions? Are we clear? Uh, yes, sir. Okay, so I don't know how much do we have left. I think probably you have one more class left with this thing. Yeah. Yeah, probably one more class left. When we meet on Monday, then we're finished with this thing. Okay, so um, I'll upload the, the video on YouTube. And you guys have got a quiz on, on, on Friday. So I think what you've learned so far, uh, you can look at the rest of the whatever is here. What you've learned so far should be enough for you to successfully finish the quiz. So I wish you good luck. The video will be uploaded to YouTube and also your link to the video will be posted in, on Modo. Okay, so see you on Monday. Yeah, please inform everybody school has started. So it's now, it's between, marathon between now up to when you write your exams. Okay, so we are done. Thank you. Yeah.
You're welcome.